Awesome. All right, well, I think we'll get started. Um, now you're gonna see me looking in a couple of weird directions and that's just because how my screens are placed. So don't mind that too much. I'll try and give you as much eye contact as possible. Otherwise, welcome to AIRS 1. We're gonna be covering the research question, preliminary search and litter retrieval today. Um, just some quick Zoom tips before we start. If you could please keep your microphone off when you aren't speaking, that would be wonderful. Um, we've got, got lots of people sharing their names, their faculties and their schools in chat, which is just great. We're seeing a whole range of faculties to see if you can find a couple of new friends in the chat this evening. Um, where is home? Where are you now? And just to ask a question this evening, and now it says the turn on your microphone as well or use chat just because we are expecting quite high numbers tonight if you could please just pop any questions that you have in the chat um, I'm generally going to recommend if you do have any questions just note them down for the moment and when we reach the end of a particular segment then would be a pretty good time to place your questions in just in case you're preemptively asking something and if there's anything that's still unanswered we'll be happy to answer those questions for you we do have question time at the end Great. All right. So before we jump into it, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners. Um, QT acknowledges the Turrbal and Yagra as the First Nation owners of the land where QT now stands. We pay our respects to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits, and we recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. And QT acknowledges the important role that to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people play within the QT community. Now, like I said, welcome to AIRS 1. We're going to get you started today and I'm going to be taking you through just your introductory sections on what AIRS actually is, where we're going to go from there, and then we're going to move into a research question. Now, done a bit of a doozy and I haven't introduced my lovely colleagues yet or even myself. My name's Stephanie Jacobs. I am one of the education liaison librarians and I support the two schools of education as you can imagine. I'm joined here tonight by my colleague Tom Mullins who will be moderating in the first half and then we'll be doing our preliminary search and retrieval in the second half of this section presenting that. Um, he's working, he's a liaison librarian for the schools of business and law, or the faculty of business and law I should say lots of changes, still getting used to them. And we're also joined tonight by the AIRS coordinator, Linda Lugunton, um, who will be moderating and putting links into our chat this evening. We'll all be here to answer your questions throughout, uh, no matter what. We'll be positively jumping to answer them, you might say. All right, so what is AIRS? Well, AIRS is going to assist you to develop effective and efficient searches in databases and other um, information resources. And that's going to be finding the information you need, when you need it, and how to evaluate that information. Is it good quality? Does it assist you or is, does it actually serve you in the first place? We're also going to teach you a little bit about how to manage that information, the data, and just generally set you on the road to being effective researchers. A major component for you at this point is developing your literature review, and that requires you to summarize and critically analyze the most relevant literature, describe an existing gap in the literature derived from the analysis of that literature, and discuss how addressing this gap is going to make a significant and original contribution to knowledge. And that's why we all all here, isn't it? So this particular unit and as workshop one and two in particular is really going to assist with this process. Now, this unit absolutely does lay the foundations for your own independent research and that critical appraisal of information, effective and efficient management of that information. And these are skills that you'll carry with you throughout the course of your career as well. It's really great to get an awesome foundation to your career now so you just don't have all of that, why didn't I know this before, as you continue onwards. Now, the learning outcomes of this particular unit as is to demonstrate an understanding of the theory advanced search evaluative strategies to effectively yield appropriate resources. As Lou have said before, we're going to apply appropriate data management strategies and it's so incredibly important to know how to do that and that to organize and utilize the information that you gather proficiently as well as ethically and legally. 
And you're also going to be identifying strategies to ensure the best practice in the use of the information sources, the information technologies, and the different access tools and investigative methods. All of this is going to be covered through AIRS, and you're going to be able to do this by the end. All right. So a little bit more about AIRS again, it's a four credit point unit and this is a blended learning unit. So we've got our online content and the workshops. Uh, you can do the workshops here live like you already are. And if you are booked in for later workshops as well, you'll have a lovely, other lovely liaison librarians to guide you through those too. You also have recorded workshops, so if you ever want to revisit any of this content, all of the workshops are on the AIRS website, which we'll head to in just a moment as well. And you can work through the material online alone if you really wanted to. Now, because you're already here, I'm going to recommend you absolutely attend a workshop or at least watch them online, as well as using them with your AIRS modules that are there too. It's really going to make the most well-rounded experience. Now, I've mentioned the AIRS website and Lyndall has just popped the website into the chat as well. So I'm hoping that you've already been here and had a look. Now, it contains all the information necessary to successfully complete your resource log and develop all of the skills and abilities that I've mentioned prior. Um, you're also going to have lots of places to look for help. So we're going to have a quick little browse over to where the AIRS website is, just so you know where it is. Before we hop off, I've got another task for you too. So in our first activity, I'm going to want you to identify your liaison librarian, and I'll show you where to find that as well. Here it is. I'm hoping you've clicked through by now and just had a quick look, and we'll get into it a little bit further as well. But if you do have any questions about any of the content in AIRS along the way, your liaison librarian is there to help. Now, we've got a couple of different ways to get around if you need help uh, with AIRS specifically, say your resource log, enrollment, things like that. Um, AIRS at qt.edu.au is going to be the best place to go. But if you have something a bit more specific to your resource log, have a look, have a chat with your liaison librarian. We have a link here on the AIRS website. And it takes us to the QT Library website. Or if you're on the QT Library homepage, you can go to the Need Help just at the top here. Just a bit more on that right hand side. And under Appointments and Researchers and HDR Students, we've got Request of Research Support Consultation. If we click through there, it also takes you to that same Liaison Librarians page. Now, I'm going to give you about two minutes uh, to have a look at this page and see who your liaison librarian is. And I do believe I've already seen a couple of people that I'm their liaison librarian. Um, but if, you're, if I'm your liaison librarian, you actually have another one. So I want to see you also posting your second liaison librarian in the chat if you do have multiple as well. So let's go a little bit further into the AIRS website then. Now, just going back to that beginning of the AIRS website, AIRS is split into four workshops and there are 12 modules overall. There are three modules per workshop, if I do the math correctly. All right, if we go over into the AIRS modules tabs, you can see all of the work, all the modules listed out here. And they're done in an order where you can see each line um, and which workshop it goes into. So for example, we're doing module one, two, and three today, and you're in workshop one. So you would just be doing this left-hand line for any related content and so on through them. In each module, as we go into them, we'll have a PDF of the modules. If you want to print it out and mark it up, you absolutely can. And you'll also have the workshop presentation. When you do look at the workshops tab, you'll notice that it isn't just one workshop recording. It is actually split into its different modules just to make it a little bit easier for you to fit it in with your schedules. Because I know those are very busy. Uh, and you can just click through to those. So if I just grab that module here, and we scroll through, it'll see that it takes you through all the different bits and pieces. It's actually formatted in a very nice PDF in general. So I'll just print out the web page just in case you thought it might be that. And it takes you through what to do. If we go through to the workshop presentation, it'll just take you to a YouTube recording. Now, I don't feel like watching ads this evening, so I'm going to pop back and stay on the research question here. 
just our first part. You'll see that each module is also broken down into a number of sub pages and those go into a lot more depth and detail than what we could possibly get into in the workshops. We'll take you through the bulk of the content, but you absolutely do need to use the AIRS website to succeed. Now we had a reading that was just sitting in 1.1 here. It's pretty much the first thing that you're going to be doing. Can I get a quick raise of hands on who's actually done this reading just yet? So you guys are already on it then. If you've already done the reading, you're already on to the ERS website. So that's great. Now I'm just going to pop over to the workshop page as well, just to show you what I mean by it's going to look a little bit strange by comparison. It's really not that strange in the context of what I've already told you and how the modules and the different sections are split up. So if you look at all the workshops here, you've already registered for ERS. So you've already found your way to us. We can see the workshop presentation. So if you would like a copy of this presentation afterwards, you can download that and scribble all over it as much as you like, or just keep it for later. And you can see the different workshop recordings are split up. And then those are also linked in the modules themselves. Some of them are very short, some of them are a little bit longer. And we add those timings in as well, just to make it a bit more helpful. So you know what you're getting into. And I mean, a six minute module now, and you, you could do that in between even your most busiest days. So try and make it as easy as we can. Great. Now that we've had a chat about the content and the website, let's get into a bit more about the assessment and the actual resource log. So the word limit guide is about 1.5 to 2,000 words, but it is just a guide. So we're not doing a plus minus 10%. Um, if you're worried about that, you've just come fresh out of an undergrad, postgraduate by coursework. And you're going to have opportunities in every workshop to actually work on your log. So you can work on it. And all of the questions really that we do and all the exercises, they're all going to be something that you can use in your log. Um, it's not going to be any extraneous activities that you'll be wondering, why am I doing this? Absolutely not. That's not what we're here for. Everything you do will be based on what you can put in your log. Now, I do have a copy of the log ready to go, so we'll jump back out and have a look at that in a little bit more detail as well. And it looks a little bit like this. So we do have our front cover page, gives you the same information um, that I'm just giving you now on that slide. You can let us know whether you'd like feedback or not. I always recommend getting feedback. We're not going to be tutting and wagging our fingers at you. We'll more often not being saying, hey, that's really great. Have you also considered this? Um, just to kind of get you thinking a little bit further. And you can let us know how you actually did engage in it, because that's really good for us to know too. If we can often remember if we've seen you in a workshop before. Now, a quick, uh, quick shout out for the log as well. If you're looking at this and going, I don't know what this is, and I've never seen this before, don't fret. The resource log itself isn't actually on the AIRS website. Uh, instead, it's on our learning man management systems. So depending on when you started, uh, you'll either be in Blackboard or in Canvas. So if you started before the 1st of March, you're going to be in Blackboard. And if you've started after the 1st of March, you're going to be in Canvas. So you'll be able to find the resource log and the criteria sheet uploaded to either of those, depending on which one you're in. And if you're not sure which one you're in or exactly when your commencement date was, you're welcome to AIRS email that you're going to get from the AIRS team will tell you which site to access pretty clearly. And I do recommend that you hold on to that email because it also tells you about your due date and it tells you how to actually find it on the site. Um, they're both housed in slightly different ways because they're two different learning management systems. And this is just because we're transferring over to Canvas at the moment. So it's just for the time being. Now, if you haven't yet received a welcome to AIRS email, that's totally okay, hang tight. If you're very worried, you can email AIRS at qt.edu.au and ask for some assistance, but it may just be a matter that they haven't yet received your enrollment details, so they just haven't had a chance to send you that email just yet. And that should normally resolve within a week of your commencement, but you're always more than welcome to email them and ask if you do have any questions about it. Now, I've got a quick little activity, but maybe I'll just get you to do this in the background. If you do have access to your resource log and you have already started working on it, I highly recommend backing it up 
um, specifically back it up to QT OneDrive. It's a secure location for you to hold quite a bit that you're going to be working on, to be honest. You can put a lot of your files onto there so you don't have to worry about it cluttering up your own accounts. And because it's QT's own OneDrive, we know that it's going to be secured and safe. So always good to have a backup somewhere just in case something happens. Nothing worse than, you know, something happens to your computer. It, it happens, IT what can I say? And you don't have a copy somewhere. You have plenty of computers you could even use at QUT if something happened to your laptop or your computer at home. If it's all in one drive, then you can just pick up where you left off. We're going to stop for a bit and have a little bit of introductions. And I've got to say, this is one of my favorite parts of doing this workshop. Uh, we're going to take five minutes to write your elevator pitch. So, if you haven't heard of what an elevator pitch is, it's a snappy conversation that generally you can say in the span of an elevator ride. So it's about 30 seconds to two minutes, and it'll be approximately, if you wrote it down, 100 to 200 words. Now, this is a really fun portion of this, and we're going to use chat and share tools overall um, just to make it a little bit easier because there is quite a few people in here. And I do believe we're going to put you into some breakout rooms as well, just to thin out the numbers a little bit. But I'd like you to introduce yourselves, uh, which faculty you're going to be you're a part of, and probably your school as well, because some of those faculties are very, very broad now. And I'd like you to explain the significance of your research. And honestly, that's my favorite part. Sometimes reading a research question sounds like a different language if it's not your discipline, but the elevator pitch allows anyone to understand what your research is about and why it's so significant. So a little bit more about the elevator pitch, just so you have an idea of where to go. It's meant to be a concise way. Remember that 30 seconds to two minutes way of explaining your research interests, no matter who they are. Like I said, that's why I love hearing about them, because I can actually understand what engineers are going on about, for example. Um, and this could be so many different places that you could use this. Uh, you could have a brief meeting with uh, someone in your field that you really look up to, um, something at a conference, introductions around a table meeting. What are you doing for your research? Oh, well, here's something I prepared earlier. Uh, and a well-crafted pitch is going to serve you anywhere, really. Uh, we've got a HDR meet, greet and eat coming up on Wednesday. This is the perfect time if you're attending that to use your elevator pitch with other students who might be from different faculties overall. All right, a well-crafted pitch could sound a little something like this. Did you know that more than 150,000 people are killed each year in traffic accidents in India? That's 400 fatalities a day. And then you would say how your research plans to make a difference. Like that, that's quite a startling number. And then as soon as you say, here's how I'm going to help, you've got someone hook, line, and sinker. Now, I mentioned before who's actually read the required reading for this workshop. And again, like great getting a raise of hands, but I'm not going to wag my finger and tut tut, even though I've got my high school teacher hat on sometimes. Um, we had a couple of pre-workshop tasks, to be honest. So we had the reading, which we're going to talk a little bit more about Foss and Waters in this next section. Um, we also had a video, the research question, about three minutes long. So if you haven't done it yet, it shouldn't take too long. And we also asked you to write a first draft of your research question. And that first draft will be able to inform your module one question in the, res in the resource log. Let's jump in a little bit further to the research question itself. So a research question, just to clarify, it's not going to be the same as your thesis title, your research problem, your hypothesis, your research focus, although they are going to be really interrelated and they're going to support one another. Your research question needs to be clear, focused, needs to be concise, but still complex. They don't go against each other, don't worry. And it does need to be an arguable question around with which you can center your research. And it's gonna help you focus your research by providing a path through the research and the writing process. And I see some people do this by just tacking up a little sticky note to constantly remind themselves, this is my question. We move through this one. Again, it's gonna guide the research process, your good research question that we're going to help you construct this evening. We're going to construct a logical argument with that question. 
It's going to help you write your literature review, which is certainly what's on everyone's lips at the moment. It's going to help you plan your thesis chapters, and especially when your thesis is quite large, you'll want to have those planned out. And it's going to help you devise really efficient search strategies as well. A little bit more about this. All of the specificity of a well-developed research question is going to really help you avoid that all about. That's why I say the sticky note on the monitor is going to really drive you through a specific and arguable thesis so you don't get distracted by all the noise. Yes, it's all very interesting, but you've come here for one particular question. Staying on topic when you're researching and when you're writing is it it's not going to be easy. That's why you kind of need this framework to structure it as you go on. But your good research question that we're going to construct with you is going to assist you in reaching that goal. And it's going to help you guide your literature search in so many different ways. Constructing that logical argument, just being central to your review overall. And it's really going to help you write those preliminary chapters as you get started. So... If you've read Boss and Waters, then you'll be familiar with uh, this little diagram and all the explanatory bits already, but we'll go through it again just as a refresher, a reminder, or if you haven't seen it before just yet. So a good research question is going to have a couple of different parts to it. We can see them there. Your theoretical construct is going to be the issue of the event that you want to learn more about. So you're going to need to be able to distinguish and identify or recognize it overall in the literature. What does it look like? It can't be too broad because of this. So for example, what are the processes by which parents transmit their political perspectives to their children? The construct here is transmission of political perspectives. You're going to want your question to also be recognizable. The theoretical construct has to be focused on one aspect and uses a language that is recognized in your field. You can't get too creative in this one, unfortunately. So what you're really going to need to ask yourself to make sure of this is will you be able to locate and distinguish your particular construct that appear in, from the other constructs that appear in the literature? You're going to need to make it very clear in the resource log for question 1B. Uh, we don't need any definitions of those terms. We just need to know what your constructs are and where they are. Where have you found them? Reference the different sources that you're seeing, that type of thing. We want to know the why, not the what, if you get what I'm saying there. So you can have a think about um, experts, subject headings, Perhaps there's just so many papers that use it. Perhaps you're doing very, very new research and that's just what's in all of the foundational papers. Those can all be examples of the why to why you've chosen that construct. We're also going to transcend the data. Uh, except in a few very specific instances, your research question shouldn't include any mention of specific data that you're using to investigate that question. And many different kinds of data can generally be used to answer a question. So you really don't want to... Uh, limit it to a specific type. You'll want your question to be a lot more abstract than that specific data. For example, what accounting practices are used in children's theatres in, in Detroit? That data is very specific, children's theatres in Detroit. So if we thought about something that was going to trans transcend that data just a little bit more, we're going to think about what accounting practices are used in nonprofit arts organisations. And that means you can gather more data that isn't super limited. You'll want to discuss that significance as well. We're talking about in the elevator pitch, why does it matter? It's that grab line, hey, did you know this? Here's how I'm going to fix it. What your study's contribution is, is going to be that significance. How does it contribute to the understanding in the field? What's your study going to add to that body of knowledge? And what's the contribution of that understanding to the world? I think that's really cool. Your question should really convey its importance and its value and its excitement. Is it just saving money, which isn't really just these days? Or is it saving lives? Or is it saving the world? We just don't know. You're going to put that across in that significance. You're going to need the capacity to surprise. You shouldn't already know the answer to your question. I would ask why you're here if you already know the answer to your question. 
You're going to want to be surprised by what you find out. You put a lot of time and effort into this and you deserve to have that surprise. And we're also going to see all the fruits of your labor and how you're making the world a better place through that surprise as well. What could be better than that? Now, if you already know the answer, like I said, you don't really you don't need to do the research. What's that surprise? Kind of along the same lines, as far as I'm concerned, is how robust that question is. How robust your question is, is really going to increase that capacity surprise as well. If your question is robust, it's going to have the complexity and the capacity to generate results that are very interesting to look at. It should have the capacity to produce multiple insights about the various aspects or theoretical constructs that you're looking at. And it shouldn't just be a question that's a yes or a no. It's probably not going to be very surprising, trying that one. But in general, your questions should have a very complex answer. It, it's going to have a yes, but or a no, but, and that's okay. And that's that's all part of research. And that's even if it does have anything like that. It might just have but. We're going to have a look at some example questions because having a look at Foss and Waters in that type of this is what it is, it can help to have a couple of more examples of exactly what we mean by robustness, significance, those types of things. So we're going to do a bit of a quick fire round at the moment um, and we're going to get everyone primed to type into chat. I'm going to throw a couple of questions at you that need a little bit of refining. So let's take a look at this first question. Are minority mentoring groups effective in mentoring minority undergraduate students? We're going to try and see if we can make this a little bit better. How about for this one, we try and make it a little bit more robust. What are some of our opinions on that? Remember, this is lightning round. Pop it in the chat. If you've got a spelling error, that doesn't matter. It's okay. And again, how can we make this question more robust? It's currently a yes or no answer. So let's take a look at how we worked this question. We worked it as what fa factors characterize successful mentoring relationships for minority undergraduate students. So we are right on the money. And all right, we've got another one. How do climate driven changes in the biophysical environment of the Great Lakes region affect the sustainability of the wetlands? Now, for this one, we've got a bit of specific specificity here. We're going to try and think of how we can transcend the data on this one. Now, how can we fix this? We make it, maybe let's fix, make it a little bit better. Sometimes these specific questions are okay, but in this instance, I think we can make it a bit broader and really help it transcend that data. How do climate-driven changes in biophysical environment of the lakes affect the sustainability of the wetlands now? That seems very close to what we have. So I think uh, I think I know what you're up to and that's totally fine. So we have transcended the data by thinking a little bit more about removing that specific factor of the Great Lakes. How do climate driven changes biophysical environment of the lakes? And we've gone from there. So that's awesome. And we've just got one more. How does the Starbucks chain engage in oppressive practices towards consumers? I don't feel like this is a particularly surprising question. Um, I don't know why I would read this because I could just read the title and be like, ah, Starbucks engages in oppressive practices. That's not what we're here for though. So how can we make this question have a bit more capacity to surprise us? So how did the strategic management practices of Starbucks influence the consuming patterns of its patrons? That still has a lot more capacity to surprise. It might actually be doing not too badly or they might still have oppressive practices, but we'll still be surprised when we read the article. Now that we're thinking a little bit more about those research questions, hopefully you have your draft research questions in hand. And if you don't, fear not, you'll have one very soon. We're going to pop you into some breakout rooms again, and we're going to refine your research question a bit further. So what I want you to do is to take turns in sharing your draft research question and consider how your question embodies each of the six properties. And you're going to have to describe that in your resource log anyway, so it's 
Good to start thinking about it now. We're going into the deep end again and we're going to do a knowledge check. So into the frying pan, back into the fire again. Now you should have a poll coming up very shortly in front of you. And what I'd like you to do is consider what were the properties that you and your partner identified as problematic or tricky to address in your question. And you can select as many as you like that apply. It looks like theoretical construct is currently leading. Remembering again, if you are struggling with your research question, any of the particulars of Foss and Waters, your liaison librarians are here to help. Don't hesitate to reach out. And everyone should be able to see the results now. So yep, theoretical construct is in the lead and surprise is the one that everyone seems to be most comfortable with, which is fantastic to hear.